Hi everyone, I want to welcome everyone to the intelligence briefing for May 2023, Board Time Flies. So this is a very special one for me because this is a intelligence briefing where I talk about myself. So I talk about my own background with the extraterrestrials. Now we are really deep into the disclosure process with the regard to the extraterrestrials, the UFO, UAP phenomena, things like that. And this has to happen quickly, and I'll explain why that has to happen quickly in a little bit. But if we're asking other people to talk openly about this and to make change, we can't really hold back ourselves. So I, I eventually knew I'd have to discuss my own extraterrestrial background with you guys. And so today is when we do that. And I'm going to be doing that in interviews and other places from now on to explain to people. So. I'm not holding anything back myself. It's full disclosure. So one thing I want to make sure I don't do is I want to make sure that I do not make this into a special case in the sense that I don't want it to make it sound like I am special in any way uh, or especially important or like I am the great guy or I am the, the big dude or whatever. I, I don't want that to come across. So I'm just trying to explain my own extraterrestrial background and then leaving it, you know, just leaving it there. But I'll explain a little bit more about how I'm no different than everybody else. So let me just start by saying that I was born as a normal human being, um, full, normal, everything normal. I had human parents. My memory from the past is largely, that's my memory from the past, that was before I came here, is largely intact. So uh, let's talk about my early childhood. When I was really young, I'm talking like eight years old, things like that, I had an absolute fixation on getting back into space. Like I knew I, this wasn't the place I normally was. I, I had a tremendous desire to live underground. Uh, and I had a, an absolute fixation that I had to build a flying saucer in order to fly up. <laughs> One time, my, uh, some relative gave me $5, and I insisted that my father take me to a lumberyard uh, so I could buy uh, materials to build my flying saucer so I could get back to space. And um, my father brought me to the lumberyard, and the guy at the lumberyard said, okay, well, what do you want to build? And I, he pointed to me, and he said, well, it's him. And so the guy at the lumberyard looked at me and said, okay, young, young whippersnapper, what do you want to build? And I said, very seriously, I looked at him, I'm building a flying saucer. <laughs> and the guy just sort of smiled and said, okay. And we, we bought $5 worth of wood, anyway. And uh, I also, at that time, that was pretty young, but I, I built a um, shortwave radio, all with parts. It was a powerful shortwave radio. It was so powerful that I had to test it by putting out a carrier wave across all of the Northeast and then I sort of interrupted other people's conversations and then I had to turn it off and listen to see if they reacted so that I knew if it worked. And the people were really upset because this big carrier wave was crossing across the Northeast. And then police came by my neighborhood, this is in New Jersey. And they started to ask the kids in the, in the, in the local street uh, if there was any teenagers with strong walkie talkies on motorcycles. <laughs> And the kids in my neighbors, they knew, to, they knew to lie through their teeth and they said, oh no, there's nothing like that. Well, there, there, weren't, there weren't any, but they were looking for this source of this signal. They had triangulated it to, this, to that neighborhood. Anyway, I also built a radio uh, telescope, believe it or not, a radio uh, antenna telescope. It didn't work very well, but nonetheless, it was huge. <laughs> anyway, that was all when I was like nine, 10 years old. I had to communicate with the guys out there. So when I was very young, again, around that same time period, um, eight, nine, 10 years old, uh, gray ETs, you know, the little gray guys with the long and wraparound eyes, they used to visit me quite regularly at night. And they were around my bed. There were two on one side and two on the other. And um, this isn't something I had to drag back with memory under hypnosis. This is just, uh, they were there. And, um, they were never threatening. 
and they were very supportive and they were simply checking on me. I couldn't figure out why they were checking on me, but they were there and they weren't threatening and everything seemed fine. And I'd uh, wake up in the morning uh, wondering what they were doing, but they seemed like nice guys. <laughs> so I was not prevented from experiencing human trauma. I had my normal sets of trauma that people have as humans. I had a completely normal human life. Then let's go on to the college years. So let's advance up to the college years. I had an absolute fixation. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, but I had an absolute fixation on merging psychic science with mathematics. And that involved uh, mathematics that could do radical change because I just knew that something had to change big. And so I, I wrote a master's thesis on catastrophe theory. I uh, focused on nonlinear mathematics, chaos, catastrophe theory, in general, nonlinear forms. So I got, um, uh, eventually I got a PhD in political science with a focus on uh, mathematical modeling. And my first job as a college, after, after getting a PhD, in, I was to teach college calculus up through differential equations. So I was a mathematics professor for two years. I taught A-level mass in Africa is basically what it was. And um, I was fascinated also by, that's mild, that's stating it mildly, but I was fascinated also by Isaac Asimov's foundation trilogy or his foundation series, especially the science of psychohistory that merged psychic science together with mathematical modeling in a way to be able to predict and understand the future. Now, throughout all of this time, from the very earliest time period up through, up through now actually, but starting all that early years, I always reached out uh, telepathically for guidance. So telepathy was something that I didn't talk about with my friends, but it was there. It was like a constant aspect of me. So let's talk about my beginning with remote viewing. When the military people came out with uh, the remote viewing thing as being real, all types of coincidental things got me to the original meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I heard about it and I said, that's what I need to do. Anyway, so I got there and then I was given direct messages, really direct messages. Basically, these, a guy coming into my head, seeing like a light being while I'm meditating, saying, their course is ready, you're to do this, you're to contact this person at this time, and there's those things, and it would always work out. And then um, I wrote the first book, Cosmic Voyage, and that was my beginning of my experience with remote viewing. And then I was also meditating um, at Marishi International University. I used, I, I, follow, I used to, uh, actually I, 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 I meditated using uh, Transcendental Meditation, TM. That was the big meditation process that was done by all the Hollywood people and basically everybody who did meditation Really, uh, uh, all the big people basically started out then. It's not that way now, but it was back in those days. And I was um, going up to what was then called Marishi International University, and uh, that's in Fairfield, Iowa, to meditate for a month, five hours a day. <laughs> and um, this is after I wrote or after I wrote Cosmic Voyage, but before it was published. And I was, there was a lot of trouble. The military people were fighting, to put it mildly. They just fight. <laughs> and they just like to fight. Anyway, so they were fighting. They were threatening all types of legal stuff and everything. And um, I was just sort of traumatized. Like, what am I to do? I got this book manuscript coming out soon. Anyway, so I went into deep meditation five hours a day, knowing I would get one of my messages that I always got at timely moments. I didn't get any message for the whole five, whole four or five weeks that I was there. And the, it was really strange because I, uh, I really knew that I was going to get a message. Anyway, I, I, was med I was meditating three hours in the morning and two hours in the evening. And then at the very last day I said, okay, I'm going to stop all this. This is crazy stuff. I'm just going to, I'm just going to have fun and meditate. Just my last evening there at Fairfield, Iowa. And so I just started my meditation. I said, this one's for me. I was in meditation maybe for five minutes and this like light being like blasted into my head. 
I'm familiar with this type of thing. So, but this this guy blasted into my head. There was no ambiguity. It, you know, it was boom, and he was like right there. And he said, and this is what he said. It was a. Um, he said all the you were. He said you are to proceed with developing all of your ideas regarding remote viewing and the extraterrestrial stuff. Then he said, all of the resources that you need will come to you at the time you need them. And then he emphasized with emphasis, but not before. Meaning I'd get everything I needed to do whatever needed to be done, but it won't happen until the very moment that I need it. I said, okay. And then he said, and you will have to break off all your military contacts. They're going in a different direction and they're not going to help your efforts in any, any longer. You're not, they're not going to help your efforts any longer. And then he like blasted out of my head. And it, deep in meditation, I screamed, no! <laughs> and I reached out. I like zoomed like Star Trek warp drive, like zoomed out to try to get him. He was gone. So that was the end. That was the message that I got the last night of meditating for a whole month at Marishi International University. When I didn't try anymore, boom, they can. So basically, um, all throughout this entire process, direct message would direct messages would come whenever I needed them. For example, uh, my book, Remote Viewing: The Science and Theory of Non-Physical Perception, was going under a peer review process for like five years at the University of University Press of Kansas. And uh, the editor there was really great. He was uh, doing his best efforts. Anyway, I was really concerned about when I was going to be contacted. I, I, it had gone through like five revisions. It was like getting thicker and thicker and better and better. And uh, it didn't get published at the University Press of Kansas, but um, there, was always, there was always some review, one review that was going to cause problems. But it was nonetheless, the book was really improving and really getting great. Um, anyway, so um, the day that the, the day that or the the day that the comments from the editor came in, uh, they were going to come in in the evening. I didn't know that, but I was meditating during the day, and then this real strong pulse came in and said, "You'll hear back today." What? <laughs> I said, "What?" But I knew it was one of those direct messages. I, I'm talking like really loud, like someone shouting in your ear, but they're shouting in the mind. I said, I had no doubt I was going to hear today. I went to my university. I taught my courses. I drove back. I hadn't heard anything from the University Press of Kansas. I wondered when it was going to happen, but I knew it was going to happen today, that day. Anyway, I got home, and uh, sure enough, at 7 o'clock, I got an email explaining where the status was for the, for the book. And I was able to talk to the editor and stuff like that. Okay. So those types of direct messages um, really happen sort of throughout. Whenever I really need them, normally I get the guidance different ways, but when something's really important and really want to be emphasized, that's how it comes in. Um, we also at Farsight, um, when we started, when I started Farsight, that was big for the U.S. government. They were not expecting, they wanted remote viewing to stay in the New Age bookstore community. They were not expecting it to come out with like a, ma a major professor talking about it. My reputation as mathematical modeler was really stellar. I was teaching at UCLA, at Emory, University, and University of Michigan. I mean, it was like, <laughs> this was not what they wanted to have happen. They wanted it, they knew it was going to come out, so they wanted to contain it within the New Age community so it would be ignored by mainstream. And so I was sort of an issue for that. But when the book came out, and then I started to go on the radio and promoting it, things like that, it came out with a really great publisher, Penguin. Actually, it was Putnam. It later merged to Penguin Putnam, but Putnam, and po Putnam was the Editor, that was the publisher of like the book, the Pope's writings and stuff like that. So Putnam was a really big editor. And so when the um, um, Farsight first came out, there was a, there was really concern among the military. They had some military people visit us. I had we had offices at uh, a Holiday Inn here in Atlanta. And they used to talk with us about saying, you know, you're going to be tamped down. They don't want you to be too, too big, things like that. But then there was some uh, incident that happened uh, uh, in the late 1990s uh, on late night radio regarding the uh, Hale-Bopp comet. And uh, then the military people, the intelligence people in the U.S. agencies, 
um, they were they took that as an opportunity to crush us and so what happened then for about one year it started before that started way before that but for one year for one solid year we had visitations physical visitations from a gray guy it was just one of those short ETs with the wraparound eyes that would visit someone who was employed at Farsight and give um, that person direct messages to tell me that person would then come into the office the next morning for one year nonstop every day five days a week we, I would take notes and those messages that they ended up being like a three inch thick notebook of everything that we were supposed to do well um, the government or the agency was assigned to sort of tamp us down and so when this when we did a, um, a show on the Art Bell show about uh, this hell bop uh, there was a guy who ended up being a friend of mine uh, Chuck Schremick he had a he had a an image of uh, an anomaly that was in line of sight next to the hell bop comet and it was sort of odd. He had a hundred pictures of it, but he posted one to his website. He got a call from one of the most biggest astronomers. Now he was a newscaster in Houston. He got a call from one of the biggest astronomers on the planet Earth. And like his first response is to take his phone away, like and says, "What? Like, why are you talking to me? Like, what am I? I'm an amateur, I'm an amateur astronomer, newscaster." And he got this call. And um, then the astronomer demanded that he take that picture down <laughs> of that life and he said well, what do you care about that i'm like a nobody uh, i no i don't even talk about this on the news i mean it's just and but he was insisting that that picture come down anyway so uh art bell interviewed chuck Schrammick and they talked about the the anomaly and then uh, uh we took the image that chuck Schrammick had and did have had some people do some sessions on it, some remote viewing sessions. And basically we came out with the idea that it was a portal. Now out of a portal comes ships. So there were ships out of the portal, so there were ships. Art Bell later and his future guests changed that into a UFO following the comet. <laughs> and we never said it was following anything. It's just in the direct line of sight, there was a portal and there was a ships and stuff like that. And then we said, um, and then we were sort of caught up in the, sort of the, the moment. And uh, he wanted us sort of to come on again. And, uh, but this time Chuck, he, Art Bell called me and told me that Chuck Schrammick was really having troubles and he had to go to Florida to get out of all the problems he was having because of all the atten attention. So in the meantime, somebody who claimed to be an astronomer, wasn't an astronomer, it turned out, uh, mailed on a FedEx package some pictures, uh, actually some film, undeveloped film, saying it was of the anomaly, and wanted and and had it sent to us, and uh, wanted us to uh, remote view that kind of stuff. Anyway, we got the pictures, we developed them, uh, we saw them. Two of the films, two of the rolls of film were blank, and one had really clear, really clear, sharp, razor sharp images that were taken that were printed by a, a film a film printer it's like a regular printer on paper but it prints on film anyway um we never used them for anything uh, ever but art bell called me up and said chuck shamik's in real troubles uh and i told him about these in these pictures that we got but i said and he said well you got to come on the show and talk about them he called me up specifically to ask me on the show to talk about them and i said but they're not our pictures and we don't we didn't do anything and he said that doesn't matter you just come and talk about them and I said, okay, we will, but they're not our pictures. So uh, as long as you promise never to release them because they're not ours, we don't have the copyright on them. And he said, no problem. Okay. So we sent them to, we sent one picture to him. And uh, then the, uh, uh, we talked about them. And I talked about them a little briefly. And then other people came and talked about, about them. And things got a little bit out of hand on the, uh, on the interview that happened afterwards, not on my part, but on the other people that were in, involved in the interview. Got a little bit emotionally carried away. Anyway, and, and then what basically happened was that the story started to generate sort of big interest. And um, then he announced on his website and on this radio show that he was going to release those pictures, that these were submitted by Courtney Brown. And I said, what, I didn't submit them? <laughs> they were just, 
Yeah, we told them that we were going to talk them about them like anecdotally, but you said you were not going to release them. And he said, no, they're being, they were submitted by me and he was going to release them. Sure enough, middle of January, he released them. In the blink of an eye, 24 hours later, uh, major astronomers contacted Art and said, there are pictures, they were stolen from our website, stuff like that. I mean, the whole thing. So it was like, it, it, we were really, we were really, it was, it was not a good thing. And so, uh, and also he kicked us off the web, off the airways. I was able to get on one more time to try to defend myself. They demanded on knowing the person that sent us the images, which I said, absolutely not. We're not going to say that because that person is going to sue us. Uh, it was clear to me that we were set up. And so, um, you know, so, um, uh, and I'm not saying that the actual astronomers who contacted Art Bell had anything to do with anything. They, would, they just contacted him and made a complaint. But it was clear that, uh, you know, we were set up by somebody. And uh, then back to this little gray guy that was visiting us like every single night, called him gray dude. Well, this guy then guided us through the storm that passed, that, that, that happened. And the storm was really big. I mean, Art Bell blew it up crazy. And he had another uh, military remote viewer guy saying it was a it was a UFO that was carrying a plant pathogen pathogen weapon that was going to when it finally got to Earth after following the Hellbob comet it was going to drop it on Africa and wipe out all plant life on Africa. <laughs> I mean, it could not have gotten worse. And then um, later on during the year, there was a, a crazy cult. Uh, you might have heard, some of you may have heard about it called Heaven's Gate. They were, uh, they were crazy eunuchs. They actually had cut their testicles off. This is years and years ago, but they were, they were eunuchs, a whole bunch of them. And um, they were following this guy who was a absolute total nut. We had never heard about them, but apparently the intelligence people knew of them. Anyway, they all committed suicide saying that they were gonna be beamed up to the comet, to the, no, to the, uh, what, Hart, what Art Bell was then calling the Hail Mary. The, the, the UFO following the Hellbop comet. We never said it was following anything, but nonetheless, he had built it into a story of following the comet. And, uh, and then these people commit suicide, and uh, these are eunuchs. They had cut their testicles off. I, my own personal theory is that this guy was getting older, the leader was getting older, and he probably thought he was going to have to confess to his um, group of castrati that it was all a big mistake and sorry about it all. <laughs> and they were gonna look at themselves and they say, why did we cut our testicles off for what? Anyway, so we thought having everybody commit suicide was probably the easy way out. Anyway, that's what happened. So, um, but anyway, that was like a huge storm and, and we were off the radio waves for the entire time. After the beginning of January, when he released the images, we were off the radio waves. So we had no way to control anything, no way to do anything, no way to say anything. Pound, 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 pound. And the agency that started all this, they actually sent the images in the mail in a FedEx package to us that so we developed. That agency that connected all that, um, we were so naive and so stupid, but they were the ones who were trying to crush us down. They actually, we had, they had somebody uh, eventually defect from the agency and contact us and he explained exactly who he was and gave absolute proof of that. He had, a, he had a transcript of a very sensitive phone call. And um, anyway, so he gave proof of who he was and he told us what happened. We said, we did this in order to knock this down, but we, they were listening to us every night and the group in the agency were like really riveted by what was going on, including what was happening with the gray dude, all the visitations. They couldn't figure out why this extraterrestrial was visiting this group of people. And um, anyway, so that sort, of, uh, that sort of happened that, but that gray dude was the one who was every day guiding us through so we didn't make any mistakes. Like we were going to do all types of things to, you know, release the, like the original images and things like that. And the gray dude said, no, don't do anything. People know, don't, don't, don't get involved in the huge commotion that's going on. People know everything that's, people, there are, the vast majority of people don't, don't care about all this. But that was classic disinformation campaign. Anyway, we got sort of, we were, it was such a bad piece of noise, we just said, we gotta disappear. So our kept, we kept the website up, but we basically stopped doing anything public. And we just focused on research and to remote viewing. 
And that's my book was the result of all that remote viewing, the science and theory of non-physical perception. We've discovered a huge amount of stuff when we didn't do anything publicly. In addition, the gray dude, the, a lot of the things that we came out with, if you notice that our procedures are a lot more complicated, a lot more involved than the military procedures that, that were uh, released after the program was discussed, discussed openly. And um, that's because, largely because of the gray dude. We were actually wanting to change things and we would change things and try things and the gray dude would come in and say, you did this wrong, but this right, do it this way. He'd sort of tweak it. <laughs> so that's where all these SRV templates came from and all the procedures. We have a lot of procedures that we haven't even done with you guys uh, uh, evaluating, you know, for military use, commercial use, technology transfer use, a lot of that stuff. Um, the gray dude guy was really helpful and all of that stuff. Okay, so that gray dude guided us through the year in which we were having these direct attacks by the U.S. government. And um, so I've given you the basic hale Bob story. The final printed version of our response to it was in the preface of the book. So Remote Viewing the Science and Theory of Non-Physical Perception, the preface has the official story of our side of, of, our side of that. Okay, um, all right. And um, again, one of the agents of the agency, one of the people of the agency who left the agency came to us and told us the whole story of how they did it, uh, how they got the images, how they sent it to a guy that wasn't a per, an astronomer, but who said he was an astronomer and contacted someone who worked with us and sent us the images. It was a big scam, big thing. Anyway, but all of the attacks on Farsight ended after that. So uh, Farsight after that, and we went silent for a while, then we came back. Strange thing happened, we didn't get any more attacks at all. In fact, it turned out to be the opposite. We were protected, not attacked. <laughs> so uh, we were allowed to continue growing. And um, I, I'm not going to detail how, those, how that protection happened, but it was clear to us that protection had started. Okay, so now let's leapfrog into Aziz. Aziz is my son, as you know, and he was born uh, and uh, during the period of my initial entry into remote viewing. And when uh, his mother was pregnant, he came to us almost every day in the meditation room and he was staring at us. Now we could see him because we meditate and I was very used to seeing, you know, what you would call ETs or whatever. I was very used to, anyway, we, we both saw him and he was, uh, we both saw him and described him. We knew exactly where he was standing. And he would stand with his arms like folded like this. He had a white gown on and um, he sort of looked ferocious at us, <laughs> staring at us, sort of like saying, so these are my parents. What the heck is going on here? Mm, let's see. Anyway, um, he visited us regularly in his meditation room. He was a fierce type of personality. And he told us his name. That's how he got his name, Aziz. It wasn't that we dreamed it up. That was, he told me in his name. It was interesting how he told me. He came to me while I was meditating. And I could sense him clearly. He was in my head. And I said, oh, are you? Yeah. Well, what is your name? Who are you? I said, I said, who is, I said, who are you? And he said, my name is Aziz. Like, and he said, oh, oh, you're my son. You're, you're coming. Okay. And he said, yes. And he was, um, back in those days when he was still in his mother's stomach, he was ferociously upset with me. And that's really putting it mildly. <laughs> that I did not remember our original mission. Nor did I remember the bad ETs. I was still thinking that all ETs are good and all we have to do is wake up humanity, things like that. He was upset that I was focused on the disclosure process as if all ETs were good and that humanity simply needed to open up. But he understood that my, I had memory limitations at that time and he came to be my son. Well, he was clearly telepathic when he came about, as soon as he could speak. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story. I was teaching up at the University of Michigan in the summer, and uh, he was like small. He was like maybe, I don't know, three, something like that, but he could talk. And um, I went to a, back in those days, they had pornographic stores where you buy magazines. I mean, nowadays people go to, you know, 
Pornhub and things like that. But in those days, I went to the pornographic store just because I was interested in seeing something and buying something and, you know, and showing it to my wife at the time and sort of getting ideas, whatever. Anyway, I just, um, I bought it and um, I put it in a brown paper bag, or actually the clerk put it in a brown paper bag, a magazine. And I took it back to the apartment where I was staying while I was teaching at the University of Michigan. And it stayed in the, in the, bound, in the bag. I never talked about it or mentioned it. And um, I stayed in the bag and Aziz knew nothing about it. But at the end of the day, his mother said, come on, Aziz, we're gonna put you to bed now. You're going to go to sleep. And he, they started to walk up the stairs to the, where the bedroom was. And then he turned around and he looked at me and then he looked at his mother and he says, but daddy's looking at pictures of naked ladies. <laughs> anyway, his mother just looked at him. I mean, she, she, anyway, she just said, you come on with me. And I looked at him and I said, what? The? Yeah. So he was really clearly telepathic and he knew back then, I, mean, I knew back then this was, you know, you're not gonna hide anything from him. So that was an interesting story. There was lots of other examples, but that was sort of funny. So I thought you'd wanna hear that one. <laughs> okay. Um, I later on told him about his early interactions with me when he when I were meditating and he was not at all surprised. Uh, by the way, one time when he was uh, when he came to me and he was really upset with how I was so goofy happy about the explorations with the extraterrestrials, he like was so he had a, like a temper tantrum. This is when he was still in his mother's stomach. He had like a temper tantrum and he like it was like he, it was like imagine a ping pong ball in a small closet and you smack the ping pong ball as hard as you can so it rattles around the inside of the closet. That was him in my head. And I was really, I used to say, hey, look, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta contain yourself here. I'm gonna be your dad, you gotta behave yourself. <laughs> he said, okay. Anyway, that was that. Anyway, so um, after he was born and grew up, there's a lot of stories I'm skipping in the middle, but he spent a great deal of time and energy recovering his memories before birth. That was really highly motivated to him. He said he knew he had to get everything back. So this included deep meditation, going out into the desert, and I mean going out into the desert. I mean, he like, he bought a, um, a car, a big car, and a camper, a big camper, and he went out into the desert, into the middle of nowhere. And he meditated for months. <laughs> and he also did QHHT. He has a whole bunch of interesting stories about that. Um, uh, and he interacted with ETs that came to him. He could see them like I, like I could see them and uh, who visited him. Uh, and so, I mean, he could see that they were walking with him and so on like that. I mean, he's got his own stories. I don't want to tell his stories. But I will say that after my memory started to more fully come back, there was no rush on it. There was no crush. Uh, the ETs didn't push me to bring those memories back immediately. They let them just come back. But eventually they all came back. And Aziz and I, um, um, before we came here to Earth, we were really good friends, perhaps best friends. And uh, he was really excited to the plan to come here to do this thing. And there was a meeting I remember clearly the meeting, and he also remembers the same meeting. And I was presenting the plan to come to Earth and do this Farthise thing in order to save humanity type of thing. Part of, it's part of, we're not, we are not saving humanity, but we're part of a larger plan. And he got really excited about it. He thought it was so great. So the idea was for me to come first, start things up, set things up. He would come later, and then we would just sort of go from there. All right, um, my own, now let's talk about sort of my own memories and subsequent ET interactions. And this will be interesting to you, I think. But um, again, I'm not talking about myself as being special or different or better than anybody else. It's just, this is what my story is. My own memories came back uh, gradually. They could have been forced, but the ETs I was interacting with didn't want that. They wanted them to come back naturally. I guess in order to demonstrate that people can get their memories back, but there was no process to force it. And so telepathy, however, was always there. I regularly communicated with the ETs telepathically, briefly, but on a continuous basis, especially when I was in need of something. I always just checked and they would give a pulse to tell me what's going on. As I matured, my interactions with the ETs became more regular and much more direct. 
I have been on ships, point blank. I, Courtney Brown, not before I was Courtney Brown, but me, me. I have been on ships, which I remember clear as day. These are not recovered memories under hypnosis or anything. I know exactly what I did. I'm not going to go over any details for that, but I will say a few things. Um, they were direct experiences that I had and which I uh, re uh, remembered from the moment they happened. Okay, so it was like I remember what I had for breakfast. Well, I also remember these things just as clearly. Okay, I have a daughter. Uh, she works on one of the ships. She's not here on Earth. I visit her from time to time. She recognizes me as her father, and, and I did not raise her, but she recognizes me as her father, and I recognize her as my daughter. She is Aziz's half-sister, okay? She is or was, a, she, was, she either is or was bald, and she sometimes sits at what we would call a computer workstation, and I sat next to her typically, for example, and she would show me what she does for her job, and she was really proud of what she was doing, and I was really proud of her, and um, yeah, my sense was that she was also proud of me. She, she knew that I was working on Earth to help people, and, and, and also in, in these people included a lot of her relatives who she would like to see. So she knew I was doing something good. Anyway, so my interactions with the ETs have grown to be a nonstop daily thing. Um, they guide everything I do at Farsight. I have a job, and I, I had this job from the very beginning. Um, it's part of a plan that they helped develop. Um, in the meeting that Aziz and I were at where the plan was being sort of discussed initially, where he heard it for the first time and said this, and he was so excited. Um, I was doing the presentation. I don't know if I came up with the plan or if I was the leader in coming up with the plan, but, but I was doing the presentation. I was one of the people doing the presentation of the meeting, at the meeting about the plan, and Aziz was so excited about it. And they helped me, and the ETs helped me with my job. And it was known from the beginning that I couldn't do this on my own. Okay, so um, again, as uh, let's talk about the Farsight plan. As again, as I matured and regained all of my memories, the ETs increased their, increased their daily contact and communication with me. Communications are in real time and they're continuous. I have my own ideas, but always I check them uh, regarding almost everything I do to make sure I'm on track. I was fully aware that there are I, I became fully aware that there are two general sides to the ET phenomena. Uh, there's authoritarian ETs and there's free will ETs. So the authoritarian, and I'm not saying that the authoritarians are bad, but they have a certain way of looking at things. I would call them control freaks. And they think that they have to have a vision, that they do their own thing, and unless they force everybody to do the same thing, things are going to fall apart. Then anyway, they're authoritarian ETs. I come from a group of what we would call free will ETs. That's my side. So I am also aware that my side was the free will ETs and that the authoritarian ETs are dominant on Earth. At this very moment, the free will ETs have way more resources in this solar system, but they do not have a lot of resources on Earth, meaning the authoritarian ETs really control this planet. And the free will ETs are trying to figure out a way to... Humanity is involved in like a prison, as I've talked about many times. But it's really hard to explain it to people because it doesn't feel like a prison with bars or anything, but it really is a prison. People can't leave this place. And um, anyway, it's a long story. But the authoritarian ETs run it. And this is like their turf. So this is not a matter of free will ETs just flying over the White House and showing them, showing them, showing people who they are and then having disclosure happen because of that. Because they can't just invade this place. This is not their planet. So they're, but their relatives, their people are imprisoned on this planet. And that's everybody. That's like, there's like 8 billion human beings on this planet or a little less, we're around 8 billion, but there's like, you know, lots more, many, many, many more billions in the wings cycling in and out. And um, so anyway, the whole idea is to see if we can free them. So after starting Farsight, so let's jump up to the time when I actually started Farsight. 
My first assignment was to join, and this was an assignment, was to join human groups who specialize in studying uh, UFOs and psi phenomena. And this included, this was primarily groups that were, uh, had memberships that were mostly academics. So the plan was for me to try to enter the groups. One, I tried with one big group at, and then transform the organization by just giving suggestions, things like that, um, into an organization that had a bigger, more aggressive reach. Um, es essentially, changing it into a psi version of TED Talks. So most of you have seen TED Talks, and you know of TED Talks. It was really polished presentations that people give, and it's very respectful. And I, the, the idea was if we could have these presentations be really polished looking, then people would take it more seriously, and we could challenge mainstream science a little better. But it didn't work out. I ran into really steep opposition. By that time, I was fully aware that the human organizations were laced with people that, uh, not everybody, 99% of everybody was really great, really great, but they had some people, just a few, who were knowingly or unknowingly collaborating with the authoritarian ETs. Um, a great deal of mental manipulation was going on, so they may not have even been aware of the total connections of what they were doing, but ultimately at the end of the trail, the authoritarian ETs were the ones manipulating, and those, those, uh, those human collaborators were uh, really good at um, controlling that organization, and I was sort of going into it. Uh, the authoritarian ETs can control this planet only by controlling the population information content. That's the only way they control it. Controlling the population would absolutely end if there was full disclosure. So the goal of the authoritarian ETs is to contain all the information about the true ET activities at all costs. They had to make sure that didn't happen. So someone in the chat is saying, what's an authoritarian ET? It's a group of ETs, think of them as split. You have two sides. The authoritarian ETs are ones who act authoritarian way. They have a top and a, a, strict, a strict hierarchy and everybody has to follow what goes on. There's, no, there's really no such thing as people doing free will stuff, doing whatever they want. And they look at free will organizations as chaos. People, everyone making their own decisions. And um, they just think of them in terms of you know, an authoritarian fascist society at the top and going down and people have to obey the rules going from top to bottom. And we think of them as slavers. We think of them as sort of controlling a population and basically enslaving a population. Okay, so uh, the authoritarian human collaborators work for government agencies typically and they are very good at repressing knowledge of the extraterrestrials in these different groups. Uh, and then I'm not mentioning the names of any groups, and I'm not mentioning the names of any people. I'm just saying in general what happens. And they were assigned, uh, generally, these human collaborators, they were assigned to infiltrate, infiltrate all UFO groups and to disrupt them. Now this normally took the form of having someone join the group, volunteer to do things, become a valued member, because the person was doing really good stuff, and then cause personality disputes and disruptions that would frustrate the other members and cause them to leave the group, uh, eventually collapsing the groups because the membership would leave. That's what they normally do, and that was the way they used to disrupt and disband UFO groups. And that's why, the, that's why no big UFO groups actually formed uh, and stayed around and became potent because they were always being disrupted. That was the official plan. And some groups were allowed to continue, however, because they acted as what we would call flytraps. Now, they were groups that would capture the attentions of people that are interesting and interested in psi and UFO activity. Um, and the US, US governmental agency, the US government agency overseeing much of this thought that a few of these sort of academically oriented groups were valued assets because when people became interested in these topics, they would go into these groups. And as long as they could contain what these groups actually talked about, then it would keep those people in one spot and they wouldn't cause any problems. So the goal was to get these groups to really focus on academic or academic academic types of things about like 
worrying about probability, statistical, uh, statistical significance, um, trying to imitate mainstream science as closely as they could. And they were doing a great job at that. And they were, and the, and the governmental agencies, the collaborators would really sort of focus on emphasizing to these people that if they worked hard enough at looking like mainstream science with statistical tests and stuff like that, then mainstream would eventually uh, accept them. And so the human collaborators, on the other hand, the agency knew full well that the mainstream science was never going to accept them. But it kept all those people in a box. So they developed their own journals and they developed their own uh, groups and interests and they had their own meetings and so on. But mainstream science laughed at them constantly. And no matter how sophisticated their science projects were, no one really in mainstream took them seriously. And um, the goal, again, was to uh, have these groups work on like technical things, technical ideas, as long as they avoided the big picture ideas. The constant emphasis was on, was on things like statistical probability and uh, a, an absolute manic drive to gain mainstream acceptance. Okay, now um, this maintained the organizations as ineffectual fly traps. They never gained a huge membership, but they, you know, collected all the people. And these were really brilliant people. They were, they were just contained. They wouldn't take any risks. They were, well, they. They, they did a good job. They, I liked these people in these groups. These, I loved them. They were actually great and they were really brilliant minds, but they were boxed in and they stayed boxed in. So um, the general approach to how to do this that the human collaborators did to keep everyone boxed in is they always have the following tactics. This is what they do to keep these smart people sort of boxed in. They use they forcefully state fear, ridicule, and intimidation. They always state that if you do this, this is going to happen, and you can't do this or this. And they, they, they really say it as strongly as possible. And then they are dismissive. They use, the second thing they do is dismiss all interesting data and theories as technical glitches and crazy ideas. So anything that rings true and big, they say, and oh, that's a smudge, that's a, that's a technical glitch, that's nothing in a picture. That's, they, would, they just dismiss it and they say, and that's a crazy idea. So things like multiple timelines, rather than discussing the possibility of multiple timelines, they say, that's crazy, that's, that's an excuse for an experiment that didn't work, it's crazy. They always dismiss things. So it's fear, ridicule, intimidation, number one. Number two, dismissing all data and ideas that uh, as either crazy or glitches. The third thing they do is direct verbal and written public attacks. Sometimes they write it in books. Sometimes they have presentations at the meetings and they directly attack people and ideas. The fourth thing they do is that they meet with select members of the organization, pressing the flesh, so to speak, and they encourage or even coerce them uh, through, you know, psychological sort of pressuring over lunch or whatever. Um, them into doing everything from stopping publication of certain manuscripts to, uh, uh, you know, d discouraging the ide certain ideas and datas and theories. So this is behind the scenes stuff. And the fifth thing is when all else fails. If everything else fails, they, they plan, what they do is they make a lot of noise. Um, that disrupts presentations. I'm not, I'm, I'm not serious about this. They literally make noise, uh, laughing at the you know laughing at the top of their of their of their of their lungs, things like that. I've heard I've heard all types of things, and um, that disrupts the information being presented. No one really listens to the speaker anymore, and that um, that ends it. So, and I don't want to downplay the skill of these people in doing it. They're really 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 good at this, and they've done it for. Uh, they're trained on how to do it and they do it really great. So I totally failed in my attempts to steer any organizations into being more aggressive, high-end public venues of um, adventurous ideas, data, and theory. I just failed. It didn't work. The, the opposition was too well organized. The human collaborators with the authoritarian side were just really effective. And they had been there for a lot longer than I had been there. So me trying to steal the attention away from them and redirect the organizations just didn't work. 
So I basically stopped my active participation in those organizations. So the next step was to rather than change an existing organization was to create my own. So the next step was to create an organization that would be an effective outreach with respect to new data, new ideas and theories. So it had to have really a mainstream sort of look to it and it had to be really polished. And this is when Farsight was transformed into a movie company that specialized in remote viewing and extraterrestrial life. That's when we said, okay, we're gonna take Farsight and we're gonna do what we wanna do. Rather than try to teach other people how to do it, we're gonna do it ourselves. And the first goal of Farsight in that process was to rebuild the entire history of humanity. Because we had recognized that you know, people have been in this sort of authoritarian controlled system, people have been duped, lied to, and academia was totally a write-off um, for like ever. And we had to rewrite all of history. So if you look at our mysteries projects, we call them the Celestials projects, but if you look at our website in the mysteries project, there's over 50 of them. And if you look at them as a huge library, collectively they rewrite the entire history of, my, of humanity. So that's what we were doing, direct observation of all these things, viewing, using advanced remote viewing, using the procedures. And of course we had to train the people to do this type of thing. So um, that was a major thing to create, to create that library. Uh, and it contradicts basically everything that's taught in traditional schools from lower levels all the way through college. But we had to put that out there. And um, it, the, the, the results of those projects really do match up with the facts on the ground. Uh, and there's all types of crazy things that people look at. For example, the Great Pyramids in Egypt. People come up with all types of crazy ideas of how they move the blocks. They don't know how they move those blocks. Those blocks couldn't be moved by people. They can't be moved by people now. And there's some megalithic structures that have blocks that are even bigger than that. They don't know how they cut them or move them into place. So, you know, there's all types of holes in the mainstream ideas of how these things happen. And we, we, answered, we ended up answering those things. And now the library is formed that sort of re-establishes what really happened. We definitely didn't want a situation where ETs came down and told us what really happened because then it's a he said, she said thing. The authoritarian ETs were getting people to say one set of things and then our side would say other set of things and nobody would know. So we had to have a library where we went out and got the data originally. So we had to have the remote viewing done at such a, with such a high significant skill set that we could actually get the answers give the, to, to answer those things all done under defendably blind conditions. And then, with, and then to um, have that as sort of original data, not being told by anybody what happened, but rather original data that people could see. And all done on video, that was the key thing. We had to have it so that the original data under blind conditions was recorded on video. Okay, now the next stage of Farsight's development has, comes after the major library was formed, when that's what's going on right now which is to prove that the ETs actually exist by demonstrating how to make video recordings of UFOs. So that's what's going on right now because you can, you can dismiss all the mystery stuff, but as soon as you prove, absolutely prove that the UFOs are real, you can't dismiss that anymore. Now, this cannot be done by having us show the best picture that shows the ETs are real because the debunkers, those, the human collaborators, they, with the, with the authoritarian side, they're going to dismiss any photographic evidence, any video evidence that, that anybody comes up with. So coming up with one picture and saying, this is it, uh, 10 pictures, I, this is it, it won't work. So the only strategy that we could do that would get around that, that would circumvent that, was to teach people how to do their own videos. So we had to wait until the camera equipment was available to be purchased by consumers. And that happened in 2022. We had to have sufficiently high frame rates and the ability to record with full spectrum in the ultraviolet, I'm sorry, in the infrared band using full spectrum cameras with a sufficient LED, with, with, with appropriate uh, filters to give us infrared images. And then we had to be able to do that at 120 frames per second uh, in um, 4K. So 4K was necessary because you had to have 
sufficient resolution so that when you see things happening in the film, you can zoom into it and post when you're editing the video and see what they are. You can tell the difference between a bug that has wings and a UFO that has a clear shape that's zipping across at 20,000 miles an hour. So, uh, you know, we had to be able to, shooting at 4K was important and shooting at 120 frames a second because these UFOs were flying so crazy fast that we were um, having to use 120 frames a second. Anyway, those cameras, we use Panasonic Lumix GH6 cameras. Also, I just put up um, yesterday a description on the Farsight's website in the menu on the upper left, if you enter in the, in the menu on the, on the left, um, there's an entry now for uh, photographing UFOs, uh, the, or video recording UFOs, recording UFOs, and it's a printed version of the instructions of how to do it. So we could circumvent the, the sort of authoritarian dismissing, ridicule, everything by teaching everyone how to do their own pictures. So you don't have to believe a person. You can just sort of say, well, you do it. If you don't like what we do, go make your own images. And so we taught people, we we're teaching people now how to do that. And then I'm also gonna be giving presentations uh, or everywhere, basically. Um, showing people how to do that. So it's not like us giving you the photograph or the, or the video that really proves the case, but us showing you what we have and then showing you how to do it. And there's nothing that the authoritarian side can do about that because once, other body, once everybody starts taking their own videos of these things, um, then it's, the game's over. However, what was surprising to us was how much UFO activity there actually was. And most of it is UFO activity from the oppressive side, from the authoritarian side, because this is basically their planet. So I, I was really surprised at how much there actually is. Uh, at any moment of time, there's like right above you a whole bunch of ships flying around. So we don't record for more than 10 minutes. And during that 10 minutes, we, uh, we find like 20 instances of ships flying all around. And we can zoom in on these things. And these ships have really clear shapes and they're very clearly ships and we can estimate their uh, speed and everyone, everything. So we have a new show also on Farsight Prime called Identified Flying Object where we have a air traffic control specialist with decades of experience in the busiest airports in the country um, going over, you know, evaluations of speed and all types of things, technical stuff dealing with the craft. So we have, we're in that point now of sort of proving that the UFOs exist. Um, everything that you see coming out of Congress and the mainstream news and everything saying we have a few images that were caught over the last mm, 20 years and we are still cons not really certain about what that particular image represents. So we're having a new task force to figure it out or a new congressional committee. That's all crap. That's all bull. None of that is real. That's all part of the authoritarian plan to delay the issue. So, uh, because they're above us all the time, and you, you don't have to like find whether the Roswell crash was real. Just take the camera, point it up, and you'll see them all over the place. So, uh, you know, all that stuff is part of the authoritarian side. So to get around that, we have to go directly to the masses. The free will ET is a general plan for the entire project is to circumvent the authorities because they're blocked off to us and to go directly to the masses and have things come out from the masses. So the authoritarian ETs, they really have control over the authorities, including the media, media authorities, political authorities, things like that. But, they, uh, but the free will ETs have really succeeded in uh, grasping the minds of the masses. So um, they've gotten a lot of good ideas come out, from, especially from places like uh, books, science fiction books, and Hollywood with all the science fiction movies. Um, a lot of those ideas come out from ideas that are planted in scriptwriters' heads about you know, things that uh, are real but can be addressed that way. And so you get movies like Star Wars, The Matrix movies, things like that coming out. Okay, so the revolution has to come from below and that's the whole plan, can we do this? Uh, that's where Farsight is right now. So the human political establishment is again totally in the pocket of the authorian authoritarian ETs, um, and uh, the human political establishment is not free to force disclosure. So any human leader that tried to force this 
to happen would be either mentally controlled or, if necessary, eliminated if all else failed. So, you know, where are we right now? My side of the ET struggle. The free will ETs. They can defend me, so that's why I'm still here talking to you. Um, the free will ETs, they have had very little success at working with human leadership. And they have tried, but they've had very little success. Human leadership is often tempted by offers of help with ET weapon technology um, from the authoritarian ETs. And many people in the military support this, but not all. There's a huge element within the U.S. military um, that is opposed to all of that. They can see what's going on and so on. So the U.S. military is very highly divided right now. It's not possible for the U.S. military alone to decide the outcome of this struggle. But right now they're very divided. And um, the U.S. military is being forced essentially to um, respond to events on the ground, so to speak. Now, Farsight's job is to insert information into the public realm uh, that can lead to change on the ground. Now, let me talk generally about something. Past efforts to free humanity from control of the authoritarian ETs, which goes back thousands of years, was aimed at inserting ideas into human thinking and then to let those ideas gradually transform the collective consciousness of humanity such that a revolution was possible. Those efforts failed. They did not work. So the ideas were always corrupted by the authoritarian ETs into a new form of control. For example, that's how the ancient Greek and Roman gods were transformed into a parallel assortment of saints in the Catholic Church. You just rearrange things, rename things, and you keep on going. Uh, there were minor improvements in the overall idea set, uh, but the big messages were lost and control was maintained. So the new strategy is to make the transformation quickly rather than gradually. That's what's going on now. The gradual approach didn't work. The authoritarian ETs are really good at maintaining control of their turf, and anything gradual just doesn't work, and it's been tried. But this is why the disclosure process right now is so important. Slow disclosure will not work. It will lead only to further control by the authoritarian regimes, by the authoritarian ETs. A rapid shift is in, in human thinking is needed because the authoritarian ETs will not be able to handle this as easily, since they must rely on controlling the information set that's available to the human population. So if the information set changes quickly, they can't control that. Following mass disclosure of the ET phenomenon, a mass request for assistance from the free will ETs is possible. And they have, the free will ETs, have the resources to do this. But they can only succeed if humanity is on their side. So disclosure is absolutely necessary. It's not optional. It actually has to happen on the level of the masses. <clears throat> now guys, and I mean guys, male and female, nothing is guaranteed. I have been fighting these types of struggles for zillions of years. I have encountered the same personalities, the same human collaborators that work with the authoritarian ETs uh, many, many times. They may not remember that, they probably don't remember that, but those people are not new to me. <laughs> they are good at what they do, uh, but their strategies for control seem to be, they re those strategies for control seem to remain relatively constant. And I went through those five major points of how they control things. But they may do that consistently, but they're good at it. So if this new strategy of rapid change for to free humanity does not work, then the free will ETs will withdraw from the solar system. Humanity as a collective body will simply be lost but the free will ETs will continue to struggle by moving the struggle to another place and time in our galaxy, and they will try again. It would be a major defeat if this happens. So that's where we are right now. 
there's no guarantee. We don't know how this is going to turn out. And the authoritarian ETs, they don't know how it's going to turn out. They're pretty cocky right now. They think they have it all under control. They may. It, this is a struggle. It's literally not set in stone how this is going to turn out. So let's talk about the bottom line because I'm wrapping up now. I am not special in any way, shape, or form. Everyone on this planet is an ET, an extraterrestrial, in the sense that everyone came from somewhere else. Now, the so-called death traps do not affect people coming into the system. So that's why I was not affected coming into the system. L lots of people get dumped here from other planets, other places, far and wide. Even some places that are in another galaxy, but that's rare. It's mostly people from this galaxy. Uh, the death traps primarily affect people after death who would try to leave the system. So it catches people on the way out. So I have retained my abilities to remember my past and to communicate telepathically because I came in. I didn't have to recycle and get caught up. So telepathy is the, and other people who just come in can escape that as well. It's Again, the death traps um, trigger get triggered when they, and we have a whole project on the death trap. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, just watch the project. So again, it happens, they get triggered when people, when their physical bodies die and try to leave. Okay, now let me talk about telepathy. We're wrapping up now. Folks, honestly, as honest as I can tell you, telepathy is the normal way of direct communication all across the galaxy. All of those different species rely on this. They do not rely on English or any other spoken language. Now, they do have some languages uh, within different groups, and some groups rely on spoken languages more than others. But telepathy is the norm for interspecies communications. And the higher level people, whether whatever, into whatever group you are, they, that's what they use. And on the authoritarian side, the higher level people have amped up technologically amped up telepathic capabilities and use it to punish people. So, but telepathy is the norm for communication. Um, it's used, it's the norm for interspecies communication. It may seem weird, but you don't need to speak things in order to give information out. You can do technological stuff. Any idea that you can think of, you can convey with that telepathic way. But you have, but, but, the death trap processing is the primary reason why telepathy is difficult for humans. Because what happens is after people's physical body dies and you pop out, you see the light. And the light is, in a, is, is part of the death trap process. Uh, what we call isbies, people who are, uh, isbie is someone who is for the purpose of being. So other people see the word soul or spirit, but that's crazy. It's just who you actually are. So we call ourselves isbies. After the physical body dies, the isbie sees the light. The light is part of the death trap machinery. It's like a moth. It dries, it draws the moth to it. So the ISB gets attracted to things that have aesthetic value, including that. And once it gets close, it, you get sort of sucked into it. And the more you struggle, the more harder it is to get away from it. And so um, then you get sucked into it, and then there's exp your experience, you experience an, an, electro, an electronic shock that's way more powerful than lightning and that rattles you. It's impossible to kill an ISB. So for those of you who are worried about attaining uh, everlasting life, just chill out. You already have it. <laughs> it's impossible to kill an ISB, but you can capture it. You can rattle it. You can confuse it, and that's what the death traps are. And then it's an AI automated control process. And so, and then part of the process is once they get rattled, then artificial memories get put in and so on. Now it's not working as efficiently as it used to work. Uh, there's been some disruptions of the overall process, but it's still there. And that's why some of the memories are coming back, and that's why architecture is changing now. Uh, the architecture that we see now with skyscrapers and things like that, that's typical of the type of architecture in societies where people came from on other planets. So that's why some of the memories are starting to come back. The death trap stuff, it's still there, but it's not working as efficiently as it used to be. All right. Um, now... Let me talk about, to end up, my own work. To accomplish my work, what I do here, 
from the very beginning, I knew it had to stay around longer than the average human lifespan. If you look at the average human lifespan, you're not really, after education and you get a job, you're not really ready to start doing anything till after 30. And then after 55, you start thinking about easing out by 60, you're really focusing on retirement. So you're really talking 30 years of active life, 25 to 30 years of sort of high pressure active life. And that's not possible for me to do this job and that type of a thing. So I had to extend that. I had to at least double the lifespan so I could be around long enough to finish this thing. So to accomplish my job, and the ETs do not live these short lifespans of like 70 years. Uh, they live longer than that. And part of the prison planet issue is to keep the lifespans short so that people don't have time to figure things out and to do like what I'm telling you right now. So, uh, so the genetics is such that you burn the body out. And basically what happens is the body is designed to consume oxygen and sugars really fast. And by doing so, it just burns the body out. And so and it, finish, it sort of wears out by around 70, 75 years old and so on. So uh, to accomplish this work, I was not allowed to use any direct ET technology. I couldn't get the guys from the ships to sort of change me. <laughs> so, but I have been allowed to use any and all available human technology to extend my lifespan. Um, and I was able to get that information either Either it conveniently got to me, like the guy who was really pioneered it, Roy Walford. He worked at the university I used to work at at UCLA, just down the just down the street, <laughs> uh, at UCLA Medical School. And so it was, um, you know, it was uh, I was able to use whatever available technology was was here, and I got access to it. And uh, so I couldn't do my job unless I had a lifespan greater than seventy years. And I have not used any ET technology to extend my lifespan, but using this stuff that was available, and I've talked about it before, it involves severe caloric restriction, which is why I'm so thin, and um, combined with super supplementation of vitamins and minerals, so I don't lack anything. And the body basically runs on a real lean mixture, and it just doesn't burn itself out because you're not pushing a lot of food through it. And, and so the, the research says, it's not a belief system, but the research says um, I should be vigorous and um, for a total of 120 years. So I have basically 50 years to go. And like the normal human active professional lifespan is like 30 years. So I have, in addition to, to my original time span, I have another 50 years of professional lifespan. And if you look at all of the studies doing what I've done, um, and I started at the appropriate time at the year at the, around 30. Uh, the rats using who are done the, who are the rats and the snakes and the spiders and all that type of stuff who go through this exact same type, of, same type of thing of caloric restriction plus super supplementation. The rats, for example, they can still find their way through the maze and eat the cheese. Uh, there's no dementia, and the male rats are still having sex with the lady rats at the hundred and at their equivalent of 110 years old. <laughs> so, anyway, so it has that benefit. But um, so I will be around uh, for quite a while, potentially, uh, with full vigor uh, in all dimensions and without without any dementia. Uh, that's that's an important thing. But remember this: it is a war. It really is a war, so I could always be shot. You never know. <laughs> but if the current plan fails to free humanity, I'm assuming I'll be protected, so I'm not worried about being shot. But nonetheless, if the current plan, but it's, you never know. I mean, but I'm not going to die of old age uh, anytime soon. And uh, so I'll be around technically, I don't know, 50 years from today is, is what year. So 2020, say average, it'll be a long time from now. So, um, so if anyone's who's, who, anyone's in their, who's in their twenties now, I'll still be around when they're 70. Okay. So, uh, and pretty much looking and feeling the same way. Cause that's what, that's what happened to the rats and the snakes and the spiders. They were unaffected. And then when they did die, they just sort of collapsed over and they did autopsies on them and there was nothing really wrong. They just sort of ended, <laughs> but that was the equivalent of like 120 years for a human. Anyway. But if the current plan to help humanity, to free humanity fails, then I would probably have to withdraw from further participation. 
So if the free will ETs go, there's no reason for me to continue what I'm doing. So what we are trying to do now has never been done before just like this. There have been other attempts to do things, but never anything exactly like this. So we do not know how this will turn out. Um, I think I can speak for the free will ETs um, authoritatively. They can correct, no, they're telling me now, I, it's okay to say it. Um, yeah, you see how it is? I just reached out and they gave a, the answer back. Um, they don't know how this will turn out. We don't know how this will turn out. It's never been done exactly like this. Uh, the public has been primed through the introduction of new ideas coming from science fiction and books, television and movies, but the, I, the, the opposition comes from the authorities on this planet. So the authorities, political, other and others, um, that's, that's where the struggle is, the masses versus the authorities. So no one knows with certainty how this is going to end. No one on either side knows. But each side believes that they have the ability to win. That's where we are, folks. Honest. That's where we are. Anyway, so that's my history with the extraterrestrials. Um, I come from one side. I'm associated with one side. There are many groups of extraterrestrials, but there's two general categories that affect humanity right now in the solar system. Now you know for clear what side I'm associated with. And um, it's been a very interesting struggle. Aziz and I are excited about this. Every single day we talk about it, figuring out what's going to happen. New things happen all the time. But that's where we are right now. That's, that's our history. So this is what I wanted to talk to you about. That's my own background with the extraterrestrials. And let me, that is one final thing. We're getting to the crunch time for the disclosure process. If I didn't tell you this now and put it on video and make it official, somebody else would do it for me. And it would be somebody from the authoritarian side. And they would, they would try to define me, just like in any political campaign, you try to define the opponent before the opponent defines himself or herself. So that's what would happen. So I had to come out with this now before the opposition could try to define me and try to define Farsight. So this is why this presentation is happening right now. If you're going to define yourself, you can introduce yourself to people only once. After that, you're trying to change opinions that people already have, and that's always harder. So that's why this presentation is here. Full disclosure. This is my background. This is where Farsight came from. There's lots of stuff I'm not able to sort of fill in. We've already been talking for an hour and 22 minutes, but this is the basics of it, okay? So look, uh, we had a great audience tonight, and I want to thank everybody for being here and listening. And um, I love you all. Thank you for being with me and following Farsight. And um, keep Keep tuned to everything that's happening. This year, the rest of this year and next year are big deals. <laughs> Talk to you soon, everybody. See you next time in the June Intelligence Briefing. Take care, everybody.